You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is Living Without Lies with your host, Donna Warren. You're not alone if you've been the victim of abuse, drug usage, or rape. Living Without Lies is here to help. Listen as Donna Warren assists women across the country break the cycle and help create a new life. So now, please welcome the host of Living Without Lies, Donna Warren. Hi, folks. Uh, Welcome to the Living Without Lies Foundation Program. I'm your host, Donna Warren. We're coming to you from BBM Global Network, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio tonight. And uh, today we're going to, our topic for today is we want to look at and discuss the differences between abuse, and especially child abuse, and discipline, and what the differences are What works, what doesn't work, some examples of both. And we're going to try to talk a little bit about what effect the way we discipline our children has on them as people and some of the problems it can cause. Now, today I have as my my regular guest, uh, Dee, is with me today. So, Dee, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. um, This is Dee, Denise Clare, owner of Successful Living Strategies. Uh, I'm uh, a life success and health coach uh, with holistic uh, coaching, and I inspire, encourage, and educate people who hate being stuck in life situations or who are striving for the next improvement and really love to find out that they have a lot more control over their lives than they ever believed. With 50-plus years of continuous education and, uh, and learning from masters like Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins, members of The Secret, and many more. And Don and I are here to give you hope, uh, to help you know you can turn your life around and become the person you were meant to be. All right. So, uh, we were going to talk, first of all, let's talk about what is discipline versus what is abuse. You see, the same physical act or the same words could be either one, depending on how they're handled, depending on what you're doing with them. Uh, the definition that I've, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've gotten on discipline is th- discipline is something that is designed to teach you how to behave, what is appropriate behavior, and especially since we're talking about children now. What is considered to be appropriate behavior so that we in the future have <clears throat> can control our actions? So, and of course, appropriate behavior is culturally designed, derived. Different cultures consider different things appropriate. So, um, Dee, can you give me an example of <clears throat> what you considered? abusive behavior when you were growing up that was masked as discipline but was abusive? Um, Being beaten uh, to the point uh, that you ended up in the hospital, uh, being sexually abused. uh, There's a bunch. And um, and, um, really... um, when you get down to it, even yelling and calling people, your kids, others, uh, names, labels, things like that, uh, it is abusive, maybe not to the same extent, of course, but it does, it actually can, you know, ruin lives. Uh, so um, the more we learn about words and, and better ways to use them, 
uh, the more we can help each other instead of hurt each other. Well, I don't agree with you about one thing. Uh, physical abuse is one thing and all that, but my, in my experience, I might get beaten, I might have bruises, I may even have a broken bone. But those things heal. Those things heal. And other than the fact that somebody I cared about gave them to me for what I didn't consider reason, a good reason, they don't have that super emotional pain or, you know, cause that mental anguish that, uh, that, that the other things, the words that you were saying, the name calling and the other things that can be permanent. You know, well, I can yeah, think back about think things I that were said to me. Because uh, because I think we both agree that, you know, once a person believes that they're, that they're not good enough, you know, it can, it can color their whole life. I mean, no, they don't have the physical scars, but it, it does cause emotional scars. And so, um, you know, it can be very damaging. Yeah, I know I found for myself that uh, the... Emotional scars were a lot worse and much harder to deal with, and 90% of the, you know, work I've done to fix my life was to deal with emotional scars, emotional pain, you know, and to deal with that type of thing as opposed to anything physical, because, because like I said, you know, a broken bone heals, and unless it leaves you crippled, it's not going to cause any lifelong problems, and uh, it's not, so what we were talking earlier uh, about and also, discipline needs to be appropriate for the age. And one thing we discussed earlier was, can corporal punishment be disciplined, or is it always abusive? What do you think, Dean? I think it. You know, I think it can be. It can be done uh, in a decent way. I think. Um, uh, I mean, the, the most logical thing is, you know, taking your hand and spanking your kid's butt. You know, I think that. You know, is is something that you you would not consider abusive, uh, and you know, both of us, I think, from talking, uh, we were made to go out and get switches, and um, bring them in, and we get smacked with them, and uh, as long as what was being done wasn't, you know, bringing blood and and uh, you know, be actually becoming an abuse, uh, you know, it it, it can be. You know, it can be something that would be appropriate, too. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, the biggest thing here that I found, you know, with my children and uh, is the important thing of discipline is you need to define specifically what behavior is unacceptable, what the punishment will be if they ignore you. Children have a tendency to ignore when they don't, if they want to do something, and you tell them they shouldn't. You know, their attitude is one of bad, I'll do it anyway. So they need to know what the, uh, the, the, the well, you know, what the offense was, what they did that they were told was wrong, what the discipline will be if they do it. And then they need to, and, they, and if they do it, then they need to realize there's consequences and they get whatever the discipline was. And I don't know it matters that much what it is. But uh, that's for things that they do wrong. Now, for things that, they, that they're doing that are very dangerous, there's a kind of a different criteria and they need to understand more. You know, uh, an example of one of the things, I'm going to give an example of what I mean by that. When my children were little, like all children, I constantly was telling them not to run out into the street. And, uh, you know, generally they got a spanking if they did. But one day I was driving down the road with the kids in the car and I saw this cute little white dog who'd been hit by a car and was up on, on the sidewalk. And I pulled over uh, at the next street. I pulled over, parked the car and got the kids out of the car. And we went down to where the little dog was lying. And I started explaining to my children that the little dog, he didn't listen to his mommy and he ran out in the street and he got hit by a car and how mommy and daddy were going to be crying because they wouldn't know where he was. And when they found out that he was gone and all these other things that were going on that, uh, you know, they would cry and they would cry. And my kids are standing there with tears streaming down their face uh, watching the little doggy. So we left and I went back to the car and we went home. My kids never ran out in the street again, ever, that I saw, 
because for the first time, they truly understood why I didn't want them to run out into the street. I wasn't just trying to, they realized I wasn't trying to stop them from having fun. I didn't want to see them get hurt. What do you think, Dee? Oh, wait a minute, Dee. I just got a notion. We got to go to commercial. Excuse me. Let's go do that, and you can answer me when we come back. Um, Folks, uh, we, if you want to talk to us, it's 866-451-1451. We realize most of the things we talk about are sensitive and touchy, and most of you wouldn't want any of your neighbors, friends, or relatives to know you were calling in and asking us anything. So you can text me at 732-995-3969, or you can leave us a message on the blog on the radio station website under the saying, and we'll be back in a couple. There are artists and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History and the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Le Colde Beaux Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20 year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit www.asmarart.com, www.aliceasmarinternational.com, and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com. Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist, Bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of Astro Bears, uniquely created in colors of individuals' astrology charts. She also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread. To learn more about the world of Bonnie Prabula, go to BonnieGPrabula.com. And for astrology consulting, visit AstrologyConsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or BonnieGP at AOL.com. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Sheikh Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ugmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Welcome back, folks. Before the break, we were talking about children understanding why you want them to, why something is forbidden. And do you were going to respond? I asked you what you thought about that. I really thought that was um, was brilliant. And, you know, from some of the other things that you have talked about, you know, things that you showed your kids. And I think, you know, it's kind of a challenge, you know, a very good challenge, you know, our our imagination and creativity on ways that we can show our kids, you know, what happens, you know, when, when, when they don't listen. Of course, there's, you know, lots of movies and things out there today, too, that you can point them to and show them, you know, this is what happens when, you know, when you do or don't do something, Um and did you did you say that one of your sons uh, was taken down to the, the the city jail or something, or to get some idea of what it might be like or something? Uh, and did you do this? Is that what I remember? 
Uh, yeah. Uh, when my youngest son was, uh, I think he was 10, he decided he wanted to be a criminal. His idol was Al Capone. And, uh, you know, he had his own little posse and his own little group, and they burglarized some homes and got caught. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, we were told that we went to family counseling to get some help as to why he felt this way. And the counselor took him. She worked in the prison system, and she took him to the county jail with her and, uh, you know, uh, introduced him to some of the uh, convicts there. And for anybody out there who doesn't know this, most of the people that are in prison would like anything for somebody to – tell their kids what it's really like and the truth of it so that their children don't end up there too and so um she introduced him to the lifetimers it was in the local county jail but these were guys that were there they were federal the state prisoners that were there for trials and whatnot and he met several of them and they talked to him and uh some of them they scared him a little bit but not that much and uh, she didn't ask them to they just they were fathers and they just felt that way and he thought that it was kind of all put on as an act for, you know, his benefit until about two weeks later after he'd been there. Uh, it was on the nightly news that one of the prisoners had killed one of the other prisoners and he had met them both. And he thought they were both nice. And, you know, that made him rethink whether or not he wanted to become a professional criminal. And, of course, he hasn't done that. And, uh, you know, again, that was a taste of reality about what can happen and what the consequences can be and it you know it is necessary but if you're going to use movies and whatnot you need to sit with your children and watch those movies and explain to them what's going on because you and i might know but that doesn't mean they do what do you think Dave? I think that's an important point, too. And lots of times, even if it's not a movie, even if it's just something we tell them, uh, they may not get, you know, what we are saying. It might have a totally different meaning to them. Uh, the more I, I learn about kids and, and how their their minds work and, and how the, the conclusions that they jump to, uh, we really do have to explain a lot of things to them that we understand fully. But they get entirely different meanings, and and often those meanings, you know, uh, can affect their lives adversely too. So it's really important for them to really understand what you tell them and what they're watching. Yes, it is. I mean, you know, um, because as I've told the audience before. I teach. Um, I teach in, at the college level. And the one thing I've noticed with uh, watching other instructors is that uh, we, our students at the college level, students can be anywhere from 18 to 80. But the majority of them are between 20 and 40. And uh, I've, I've watched other instructors will be giving uh, examples of things. And they're giving an example that the 30 and 40 year old, a uh, 30 year old would understand, but the 18 year old doesn't have a clue what they're talking about. Our cultures are changing. And if I, as a, I myself keep up with what's going on with the younger people, so at least I have a, I can make a reference that's culturally relevant for them. I mean, does that make sense, Dean? Oh, yeah, and I think it's important. I, again, I think it's important that we're bringing this stuff up because I think parents and teachers, teachers alike, I mean, they uh, have an assumption that because they understand it, you know, that the students are going to understand it. And I think uh, there's so much misunderstanding, misinformation uh, that happens simply because the kids don't think like adults really until they're about 25, somewhere around 25, and um, and so the more we can make sure by asking questions, you know, what are you getting from this? So what does this mean to you? Uh, when I said this, you know, what did it mean? How do you feel about it? Uh, and the more we ask questions uh, like that to anybody we're talking to, even yes. other places between men and women. Uh, their brains are wired differently, they think differently, they're brought up culturally different, their means of communication and play and work and everything is different. So 
uh, there's an awful lot that gets lost in, you know, in, in, in talking to each other. Yeah, and I'm going to give you, let me give you an example of uh, what we're talking about here, folks, because uh, my children are, for, are 40 now. And uh, I can remember when they were young and, uh, you know, when they first got married, when they were in their 20s, uh, we were talking about, uh, there was a thing on the news about one of the rappers at that time, and I don't remember which one it was, but his wife died in childbirth. Now, for anybody over at that time, we're talking 15, 20 years ago, but at that time, Anybody older than 30 knew what it meant to die in childbirth. My children were shocked. They'd never heard of such a thing. It never occurred to them. They did not know anybody whose mother had died in childbirth. They had never heard of it. They were totally shocked. And that was just one generation, and that was a cultural difference. They had no idea what I was talking about, and I had to explain it to them because they didn't know. It was not part of the culture in which they grew up. And their common knowledge among their age group. So, I was just told that we need to go to a commercial. So, let's do that. Uh, if you want to call, it's 866-451-1451. Uh, text me at 732 3969 Or you can leave us a message on the uh, blog on the radio website under, the, under our program. And we'll be back in a few. Unleash the obstacles that bind you with certified professional coach Joanne Charette, a master practitioner in energy leadership. Joanne can help you break through personal and professional barriers and guide you to a higher level of empowerment and fulfillment. Passionate and dedicated, Joanne engages with her clients on a mutual journey. Her dynamic energy will motivate you to move forward as you partner on a venture to greater results. Isn't it time to make a breakthrough and commit to live the life you deserve? Invest in yourself and let Joanne Charette be the catalyst to the realization of your dreams by making them a reality. Based in Quebec, Canada, Joanne is also a space coach using social media and Skype to work with anyone, anywhere around the world. Contact Joanne Charette today at 819-360-3266 or email her at actionrealization at live.ca 819-360-3266 Now is your time. Hi, my name is Myra Fox, and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page -page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. Hi, folks. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about the generational cultural differences among people. And I talked about my children being shocked by the fact that women died in childbirth. To their generation, that was unheard of. They also weren't going to get vaccinations for their children, for my grandchildren, because they'd heard things about autism with vaccinations, which has been proven to be not true. But what the thing was... My children had no idea what polio was. They had no idea that measles, which because they were called childhood diseases, they had no idea that measles could be fatal, that mumps could leave males sterile if they were over the age of 12 when they got it. Uh, if you know, They didn't know these things because they were no longer common. You know, I remember hearing somebody say with my... Uh, you know, about my children, the specter of the iron lung, they had no idea what an iron lung was. They had no idea what polio was. They'd never known anyone who had had polio. You get the picture. That's just one generation. That's my generation and my children's generation. So we're talking about a 20-year period there, approximately. 
That's how much things can change. And this is where we run into communication issues, you know, because of the fact that these things are different. What was common knowledge 30 years ago, in many cases, the young folks today, you've never heard of it. Is that What do you think, Dee? I agree. I mean, when we were growing up, we had dumb phones. They didn't do anything. They had a dial, and and you just dialed the dial, and you talked to somebody someplace else, and that was it. You, now we've got really smart phones. And so, you know, it's, it's changed dramatically. I mean, when I was young, uh, TV was was just beginning. And it was black and white, and there were only a certain amount of channels. And, and after a certain time, you got nothing but, but um, these little flakes of white and gray and black uh, that we called snow. And, and uh, you didn't get to watch anything until the next morning. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Yes, yeah, so that can be a big problem. And uh, see, the thing is, the, the difference is... Uh, and we we don't keep up with the kids now. But today's youth knows all about the opioid crisis. They know all about AIDS because these things are here. You know, will this will that be a big problem twenty years from now? I don't know. We've always had drug issues, but they weren't to the point that they are there. I mean, if you look back through our our history here, you'll see there were drug issues back in the early nineteen hundreds. Uh, it wasn't illegal back then. Drugs weren't illegal, but still people had problems with them. You know, we uh, started fighting a war on drugs, I think, in the early 50s. And here we are, what, 40 years later? And uh, the problem's worse today than it was back then. So the uh, thing about it is our cultures are different. Our reasons are different. So when we were talking about abuse, I mean, uh, how many young people smoke today? Not that many. When I was a young person, a teenager, when Dee and I were young, uh, everyone smoked. Everyone smoked. You know, it was a sign of being an adult when you could smoke a cigarette. And we, we all smoked. Was it healthy? No. Did they eventually find out that it wasn't healthy? Yes. It took a while, but they eventually figured that out. And, um, you know, all of these things can happen. And that sort of thing, you know, it, it's different. But we were talking about punishment versus discipline. Now, all these many things I've talked about, uh, I can remember, for an example, with my children telling them about drugs and not using drugs. Uh, and I can, I think what my daughter-in-law told me that my son, my one son said to his friends, I think was an excellent example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, my son told uh the guy that his mother had had a drug problem when she was young, and he didn't want to have all the problems that she had. And uh, the guy said, oh, your mom just doesn't want you to have fun. She's just trying to keep you from having any fun. My son turned around and looked at him, and he said, but I've never known my mom to lie to me about anything. And if you're disciplining your children and you want them to do things, the one thing you got to be people is be honest with them. Tell them the truth. You don't have to have, you know, part of my whole... Living Without Lies program is truthfulness is mandatory, honesty is optional. You know, I don't have to be honest with everybody, but I need to be truthful with everyone. And uh, Dee, what do you think about that? I, I understand what you're saying, too, because uh, there are some things that, you, you know, that other people don't need to know. And, and, you know, or, and when, or you could be saying something that would be harm, you know, hurtful, not harmful. I mean, if some, uh, was asking you, well, do I look fat in this dress? You know, you would try to find some kind of a tactful way of, of talking to them about that. Uh, so you don't have to tell them, you know, uh, you have to tell them truth, but you don't have to, t you know, be, totally honest uh you know there may be something that you know that if other people knew would be hurtful to you know uh, to somebody else uh, and it would be unnecessary for you know for anybody to you know to know that it wouldn't uh you know it it was it's just a private matter that you know was better left unsaid because it could cause trouble for a family member or whatever okay 
Okay, it sounds like we're going to have to be going to a commercial in just a couple minutes here. And so we're hoping that you will be keeping continuing to listen to us on uh, BBM Global Network and tune in radio and iHeart Radio. And uh, we'll be back in a few. Hi, my name is Myra Fox and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. Abuse happens every moment of every day. According to national statistics in the United States, every two minutes, someone is sexually assaulted, and every 10 minutes, a report of child abuse is made. Those currently struggling with abuse, or if you know someone who has been the victim of abuse, you are not alone. Whether physical, mental, emotional, or sexual, no, there is hope, there is help, there is healing. Author Tammy Hall has written a book from her own account of abuse called Journey of Courage that can guide you through your own personal journey of healing. Stop struggling through life. It's your story. It's your healing. And it can begin with the first turn of the page. Visit www.journeyofcourage.com to begin your path to becoming the person you were ultimately created to be. Healed. Hopeful happy. Hi, folks. Welcome back. Uh, We were talking about uh, different consequences and punishments and abuse. Now, we were talking about why you need to explain things to your children when you don't want them to do something. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between punishment and abuse. As Dee mentioned earlier, my grandmother used to make me go cut a switch off of the bush outside, and she'd whip my little butt with it when I did something. My mother, I couldn't tell my mother would hit me anytime she was unhappy. Now, my grandmother never punished me or used that switch on me unless I did something that I had been specifically told not to do. And she told me why I shouldn't do it, you know, either. And sometimes it's just because she didn't like it and didn't want me to do it. And that why I shouldn't do it. And that if I did it, the punishment would be switching. I would get have to get the switch or something else or some other type of thing. The punishment tended, she tried to make it fit the crime. And uh, that was never a problem, and that was not abusive. I mean, we may not like corporal punishment much anymore, but it's not abusive when used properly. But my mother, on the other hand, I could come walk in the door, you know, in the room today and say, hi, Mom, how are you? And she'd be, oh, fine, sweetie, what are you doing? Oh, yap, yap, yap. I could walk in tomorrow and say the same thing and she'd slap me in the face and start yelling and screaming at me. And I had no idea why. Because when my mother was upset about something or she didn't get what she wanted or if she was just in a bad mood, she'd take it out on me. That's abuse, no matter what you do. If it's a silent treatment, if it's, it doesn't make a difference what you do. When you do something like that and you cause that kind of a problem, when there's no valid reason for you to be doing it to the other person. It's very confusing for a child to not have any idea why they're being punished and why saying hello today was fine and you got all kinds of sweetness and niceness, and then the next day you say hello and you get slapped or something thrown at you or whatever. It's very confusing because it's impossible for them to learn what behavior is okay because there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to why you get punished. What do you think, Dean? Well, I agree. My my mom was very much the same, and uh, and Dad was wonderful uh, sometimes, and then he was 
horrible others and, uh, you know, kind of a Jekyll Hyde type thing. And, uh, and, and it keeps you in perpetual terror. At least that's how it affected me uh, because I never knew whether I was going to be okay or whether I wasn't. And, uh, and it is hard to know what to do and, and, um, and it's horrible for a child to have to go through something like that. Yeah, it is. And it's difficult to figure out what's going on. And it does lead to um, being afraid all the time because you just have no idea what is okay and what isn't okay. And, of course, we go along with all of that with, you know, it wasn't just the physical abuse with my mother. It was the name calling, you know, and how I was useless and stupid. You know, I was a good student in school. But if I didn't get straight A pluses, I got punished. You know, and I was a pretty decent student. You know, after a while, I just quit trying. But, uh, you know, anytime I wasn't perfect, I got punished. Especially because my mother's biggest concern seemed to be whether other people would think she was a bad mother, and she she decided that by my behavior. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but that's totally unrealistic to expect a child to, uh, the child's behavior to convince other people you're a good parent. You know, children make mistakes. You know, the last time, I, one of the biggest revelations I got in my lifetime was the fact that everyone has the right to be wrong. We have the right to make mistakes. We don't have a right to get away from the consequences of our mistakes. We have a right to make mistakes, and hopefully we learn from the consequences. But it's extremely confusing for a child to not know. And, uh, Dean, I'm going to ask you to explain to me what you did a, a, at an earlier time about the name-calling and how that affects people and how about telling the folks about that. Okay. Well, uh well, when you when you call a person a name, uh, and particularly if if it's repeated uh, enough, it, it causes the person to feel like like there's something wrong with them personally. They they internalize it, and it's not you know it's not like you made a mistake. It becomes I am a mistake. Now, if you make a mistake, then that can be corrected. But if you believe that you've become the mistake in their mind, there's, what do you do about that? You know, how, how do you fix that when you're the mistake? And, and that's what happens in, in young people's minds. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, most people, it's, it's really critical. And I think it's talked about too much about, about who you really are. You know, you, you're not what you do. You're not what you think. You're not your body. You're not your mind. You're not your thoughts. You're not your actions. You're not. Um, you're, you're not your relationships. You're not your profession. You're none of those things. You are that essence that is there as long as your heart is beating, and that leaves once you're gone. And so you are just. You are none of those things. And we all identify, uh, and it's part of trying to make sense out of the world, um, that unfortunately, particularly, well, we all do it because as little kids, you know, we, we have very little um, uh, life experiences, and our brains are just beginning to grow. And again, uh, you at least 25 before you actually have an adult mind and can think like an adult. So we jump to all kinds of different conclusions about who we are and how life works and, and um, uh, who, how, we are, how we perform, how we can perform in whatever. And all of that colors every bit of our life from that day onward. And even though we might consciously start learning something different, uh, it's very hard to change those early beliefs because it's, it's deeply embedded in, into our, our subconscious minds. And so it's important to help others to understand these things, particularly little kids as they're growing up. So there's a difference between your who and your do. 
and so many of these other things, and that we are just so much more than all of those things. And I really believe that we are basically pretty decent people. Okay, folks, I was just told that we need to get another commercial, so if you want to talk to us, call 866-451-1451, or you can text me at 732-995-3969. We'll leave a message on the website blog under our name, under our show's name, and uh, we'll be back in a few. My Dreams, My Challenges, and Joys is an inspiring book by author Linda Genazzo. This real-life account of raising a child with autism from birth to adulthood takes you on a journey of compassion, love, and hope as it tells the incredible story of a devoted family and their beloved daughter. Together, they faced adversity and never stopped believing they would find the help they were seeking. A breast cancer survivor, Linda Genazzo has a giving heart. With a background in social work with the mentally ill and the homeless, Linda continues to help families in her community. And her book, My Dreams, My Challenges and Joys, brings greater awareness to autism and those families in need. To purchase your copy, visit www.lindagenazzo.com. It's also available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. Don't delay. Get your copy today. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Welcome back, folks. Uh, before the break, we were talking about, uh, Dee was talking about the fact that the names and things we call our children, they can end up believing that they are what we call them. You know, if you tell them, well, you're stupid. If a parent keeps telling their kids stupid, they tell them they're stupid. There are two people on this planet that will believe that that child is stupid. The child himself and the parent believe they're stupid and you know the thing about it with our parents when our parents tell us something like that we have a hard time believing anyone who tells us otherwise tells us different uh and you know this is a big problem i mean uh, as a a college teacher i know that uh, i get plenty of students that come in that they're in school and they do well in schools and they're there simply and solely because they want to prove someone else wrong Someone that told them they were stupid and worthless and useless and that they'd never amount to anything and all of that. And they came to school to try to prove those people wrong. And considering that was part of the reason I went to school uh, to prove folks wrong, that it's an excellent incentive for people to, to succeed and do well. But should we have to 
do that to them? Should they have to? Should they have to be forced to prove to themselves that they're not what these people said they were? What do you think, Dee? Uh, I think you know that hopefully that when we're doing a lot of this, that we are bringing attention to things that most people really don't think about. And you know, it's not that that we're bad parents. It's just. Uh, we lots of times are are repeating what we heard ourselves uh, and uh, not even realizing how it affects young people uh, and, uh, and and how they interpret what is happening uh, it's totally different from from what's really happening and what's what's really meant and and it does it, it has lasting lasting uh, consequences for for the young person and throughout their whole life unless they are able to learn that these things are not true their lies uh their misconceptions their stories and and they're not valid no and you know uh we'll think about all this and i'm sure a lot of the people out there can uh relate to it and now let's talk about the other side of the coin we have folks out there, I mean, the medical term is narcissist. You know, these are the folks that think they're smarter than everyone else, better than everyone else. Uh, they put other people down to make themselves feel good. They think they believe they're entitled. You know, I watched a movie the other night where some narcissist was uh, somebody, his psychiatrist canceled uh, his you know, his appointments because somebody needed something else happen. They actually killed the person that took his appointment. That they can be to that extreme, although most narcissists aren't aren't particularly dangerous or just annoying as all get out. Now, uh, what do you think causes that? You know, well, I would think uh, most children most children are put down, not not built up. Well, you know, the thing. Well. It can it can happen several ways, but but part of it is you know they they feel bad about themselves too, and when a per, when a young person uh, it usually starts in childhood when when you start feeling bad about yourself really really bad, uh, it can manifest in in two ways one where you're just really uh, uh, down on yourself all the time and, and feeling pretty worthless, uh, you know, in a, in a more conscious way. But the other side of the coin is, is, is behaving that way and, you know, narcissistic and grandiose and, and putting others down uh, and stuff like that. But it, it, it's because they feel so bad about themselves. They have, they're trying desperately to find ways to make themselves feel good about themselves. And they really don't know how. And that's just their way of, of trying, you know, to get attention and trying to feel like they have some value. Uh, so that's not the same causes, but just different ways of expressing itself. Well, I was also wondering if maybe part of the problem is that the that they're not truly disciplined, or they're or they're protected from the consequences of their actions. That has a lot I mean, to do with it too. I mean, like I was saying, there there are you know several reasons why that happens, and what you're talking about it can be you know a reason for that too. Uh, they uh, they are um, just uh, they are are. Uh, well, I can't think of the word at the moment, but they are treated in ways that they aren't held responsible. Everything they do is is, is just wonderful, and so it just it it can that can cause things like that too. Okay, so it um, yeah, it's a uh, an interesting situation. Uh, I, you know, it seems to me that uh, that seems to be a dual coin. People who, uh, I, I can give an example of that. My third husband, my one stepdaughter, uh, she could do no wrong as far as her father was concerned. Anytime she got into trouble, he got her out of it. She never had to face the consequences of anything she did. Anything was okay. You know, there were no punishments. There were no penalties. You know, basically, she ran the house. 
you know, she's the one that made the rules uh, once he and his first wife broke up. This was his youngest child, but she she was running everything and she was calling the shots. And uh, that went on for a long time. I, you know, he tried to do that to my sons and I told him he wouldn't. And even that daughter told my ex-husband that, uh, you know, they were my sons and I should be the one to make the rules for them. But the thing was, at age 26, uh, she was doing drugs. She got AIDS. She died from AIDS. And even then, according to her father, none of that was her fault. And, and it was unfair that she died from it, you know, that she'd never done anything wrong and et cetera. And, you know, I don't know that she was a narcissist, but she certainly was enti- felt entitled and thought she could do anything she wanted to do. She should get everything she wanted to do, et cetera. What do you think about that? I, I'm in total agreement. I mean, that's... Um... You know, it's an extreme case, but that goes on all the time. And and we sometimes parents really believe that they're helping their kids when they do that, but they're not. Uh, and and it's only when we realize that when we do certain things, there are consequences, there are reactions. And if we want to avoid those things, we can't expect parents or other people to rescue us. We have to face the consequences and learn something from it. Otherwise, we'll never have a good life. All right, we need to go to a commercial, so let's do that. 866-451-1451. Text me at 732-995-3969. Or leave us a message on the blog on the radio station website, and we'll be back in a few. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled Counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at Renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru Way. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication free. This full service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Wait No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Wait No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Wait No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Wait No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Welcome back, folks. Now, today we've been talking about consequences, discipline versus abuse, you know, for life. And I'm definitely, you know, the thing is that um, physical abuse is not a good thing. Broken bones are one thing, you know, uh, bruises, broken bones, slashes. Unless they leave us with permanent scars or if they leave us crippled, these things can, you know, we heal, these things heal. You know, other than the fact that the pain caused by someone you care about or someone who's supposed to love you, doing this to you, they heal. But those words, the things we do when we do name calling and all of that, when we never tell, when we only tell our children that they're bad and no good and a disappointment, 
and we never give them credit when they do something good. We never praise them for doing a good job. We expect perfection from them as, instead of allowing them to find out what their true skills and abilities are. And, uh, you know, we don't do that. And, you know, everyone out there, everyone on this planet can have something to offer. Everyone out there is capable of being an independent, self-supporting, contributing member of society. And, but we have to tell them that they can be these things from the time they're little. they got to grow up believing it's possible. There's a lot of folks out there who don't believe it's possible for them to do anything. And that's so sad. Because the first thing they got to do is open it before they can even consider becoming and doing the things that they're good at. They've got to get over the feeling that it's a waste of their time and they're wasting, you know, they're just not good enough. And unfortunately, that's a very, very common feeling. One of the reasons we have the opioid epidemic we have today is because so many people feel they're not good enough and they're wasting their time and they're not going to be able to be successful and they can't achieve anything. They're worthless. They're useless. I mean, come on, even Hillary Clinton called most of the people in this country deplorables, useless eaters, you know, uh, and this is unfortunately how many people feel. Now, folks, it's uh, time for us to go away, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that you enjoyed our show tonight, and I hope that you, you know, that you will have a, a nice to a better day and a nice week, a good weekend, and that you'll come back and visit with us next Monday. And to all of you, I say, God bless you. Have a nice night. You've been listening to Living Without Lies with your host, Donna Warren. Contact Donna at D-L-U-H-R-S at Comcast.net or call 732-995-3969 for information about the Living Without Lies Foundation. You are not alone on the path to building a new life. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company